In this video, we're going over the concepts that are on the chapter four review. And since I'm not there to go over specifics with you, I wanted to address them in this video with you. Um, I've highlighted some key things and color coded them to kind of help out. And these are the main concepts that are on your chapter four test tomorrow. And so here we go. First off, this one is telling us you're expected to be able to write the equation of a polynomial that has certain x-intercepts with characteristics and goes through a point. Now I have a color coded here and the reason why is I can't really address some of the specifics that I've noticed that I wanna make sure you do not do on the test. First off, it's telling you you have to write the equation as f of x. So you should have f of x equals in your answer. Um, now you're told that it crosses at x equals five and one, and that it bounces off the x-axis at x equals negative two and passes through the point three, negative 40. So right off the bat, here we go. I know I'm gonna have to have f of x equals. So I'm gonna put that down. That was in green. Um, I can see that it crosses the x-axis at five and one, which means x minus five, x minus one are the factors. And if it bounces off at negative two, that means it's a double root. So that's why I have x plus two squared. Now, if it passes through the point three, negative 40, I'm gonna plug in three for the x. And when I do that, I'm going to get negative two times two times 25, which is negative 100. And I'm gonna plug in the 40, negative 40 as the output. So I have negative 40 equals negative 100a. And when I simplify, I would get four over 10, which is two fifths. So that's my A value. So when we do this, this is the little stuff I can't quite address since I'm not there in class, but you need to make sure you write your answer properly. It's a function, which means function notation. I'm gonna use f of x equals the two fifths, the x minus five, the x minus one, and the x plus two squared. The order of the parentheses do not matter. Um, what I wanna make sure you, I address with you is that when it says write the equation, it's telling you how it wants to be written, f of x equals. So make sure you include that. All right, so now we're looking at number two. In number two, we are told to use our calculator, which you can see here, I already have the polynomial function inputted for us. Use the calculator to find one zero. And here's what, um, the reason why I have this color coded is you have to say what the zero is that you find from your calculator. A lot of students in the past, they've gone through, they found it, but they didn't write it down. They just went right to the division aspect and try to do the purple part, which was finding the remaining zeros. And they would only write down the remaining zeros. They wouldn't write down the one they found from the calculator. So that's the first thing I want to address is the green part. Use your calculator to find a zero. Well, you're going to have to answer that part of the question. So I have it typed in. Now, before I hit graph, let's think about this. It is a cubic um, and it's a positive uh, leading coefficient. So it's odd it's going to be increasing from left to right. So when I look at this graph, you can look and see, it, you don't see the downward part where it turns around. You only see one real zero. Um, and that's really what it is. There's only one real zero. There's going to be two imaginaries there. So it looks like it's negative three. So I'm just gonna check by using the table. I'm gonna hit second graph. And at negative three, the y value is zero. So then that is my first thing I'm gonna write down is from the calculator, I get x equals negative three. And so that's going to be my answer. X equals negative three is one of the zeros. I better write it down. So that's the first part in the green. Um, the next part says use polynomial division to be able to find the quadratic that you will solve to get the remaining zero. So I'm gonna set up division, x plus three on the side. I have my x cubed. Well, to get x cubed, that'd have to be an x squared. And then x squared times 3 is 3x squared. But I don't want 3x squared. I want positive x squared. So that means I have to subtract 2x squared, which puts a minus 2x on the top. And then that puts a negative 6x in the bottom. But I don't want negative 6x. I want positive. Sorry, I want negative 1x. So negative 1x, I'd have to add 5x to that, which is a 5 on the top. And that gives me a 15, which my remainder is zero. And you should have a remainder of zero when you're doing this. So the quadratic I'm left with is x squared minus 2x plus 5. So you can see that's in the purple. That means I need to use my solving techniques. Well, it's not factorable. I could complete the square because, you know, that is fun. And it's not too hard to complete the square with this one. 
Um, but I'll use the quadratic formula. Um, and this one, remember, quadratic formula, I like to start with the b squared minus 4ac, the discriminant part, because that has a lot more mental math that you can do. My b is negative 2. Well, negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times a times c. So 4 times 1 times uh, 5 is 20. So 4 minus 20 is negative 16. The fact that's negative tells me that I'm going to have imaginary answers, which I knew because I couldn't see the x-intercepts on the graph. And so now I go to the quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over twice a. So the negative of a negative is positive. Since it's square root of negative 16, the negative can come out making an i. Well, the square root of 16 is 4. So I have 2 plus or minus 4i over 2, which can simplify down into 1 plus or minus 2i. And that is the other solutions. It is 1 plus or minus 2i. So make sure you understand, if you just write down 1 plus or minus 2i for your answer, it's wrong. Even if you still show this part, you're telling me the factor, but you're not telling me the answer of negative 3. So understand the color coding here, the things I'd like to address if I was there. Um, you have your real 0 of negative 3 and your two imaginary zeros of 1 plus or minus 2i. The next problem looks at adding rational expressions. Nothing too fancy here. Um, you need to find a common denominator. So if I take a look, the first fraction is not factored in the denominator. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to factor x squared plus 4x minus 12 into x plus 6x minus 2. So I no longer need to look at that x squared plus 4x minus 12. So now if I look at the two denominators, I can see what I need the common denominator to be. And they both have the x plus 6, but that one on the right needs the x minus 2. So I'm going to multiply it by 1. Really, I'm going to multiply by x minus 2 over x minus 2. Now, keep this in mind. You know your denominator, the common denominator is x plus 6, x minus 2. There's, you know, that's what you're going to have in your answer unless you can simplify. But there's no reason to keep writing it over and over and over again. The only part we need to focus on is the top there, the distributing and the combining like terms. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to write down the numerator expression. So I'm not um, I'm not going to be tricked into maybe trying to cancel something out that doesn't need canceled. So in this case, I'm going to distribute the x. And I would get x squared minus 2x plus x plus 3. And then combine like terms. And I get x squared minus x plus 3. That's just by distributing and combining like terms in the numerator. But this is a rational expression. I, I just did all the work in the numerator. I still need the denominator. So I'm going to write down my common denominator the x plus 6 and the x minus 2. But I didn't change anything with it yet. It's still what it was. So I did all the distributing and combining in the numerator and kept the denominator as is, but there's still something missing. And this is you know, why I want to address this since I'm, since I'm not there is, that's great, but where's your excluded values? We have the common denominator, x plus 6, x minus 2, but we need to realize x cannot equal negative 6 and x cannot equal 2. Um, those are excluded values. Those are where you would have vertical asymptotes if you were graphing. So that's what I wanted to address when it comes to adding um, or even subtracting rational expressions. Now, in number four, I had to correct something is it does say multiply, and I do want you to multiply. So change the division sign into a multiplication sign for this one. And so in this case, this is about factoring and crossing out. And so we're going to kind of do it in parts. We're going to focus on the top left numerator of 5x squared minus 5x. To factor out there, they have a GCF in common, a greatest common factor, and that is a 5x. So if I take that out, I'm left with x minus 1. Now, the denominator, x squared plus x minus 12, is just a trinomial. So what multiplies a negative 12 adds to 1, that would be x plus 4, x minus 3. Now I'm going to focus on this x cubed plus 5x squared plus 4x. Now this one's a little bit different. Um, it's a cubic. But notice they do first all have an x in common. x cubed, 5x squared, 4x. So I have this off to the side. This one's going to involve multiple factoring techniques. And what you're going to do is first take out that GCF of an x. And that leaves you with a trinomial x squared plus 5x plus 4. And then you're going to factor what multiplies to 4 adds to 5. That'd be x plus 4, x plus 1. So this one involved two factoring techniques, uh, GCF and then into trinomial method. And so that's what we're going to need to put in the numerator over here, is we're going to need to put the x 
the x plus 4 and the x plus 1. Now x squared minus 1 the bottom right uh, that is a difference of squares and that would be x plus 1 x minus 1. Now this is my favorite part when it comes to simplifying rational expressions with multiplying or dividing when you get to cross things out it's satisfying. And so they have an x minus uh, sorry x plus 1 at the top and an x plus 1 at the bottom. They have an x plus 4 in the top and an x plus 4 in the bottom and an x minus 1 in the top and the bottom. So in this case, in the top, I have a 5x and an x, which would give me 5x squared. And in the bottom, it looks like I'm only left with the x minus 3. So that's my answer, 5x squared over x minus 3. So in this case, it's about factoring, crossing out, being aware of GCFs, and being aware of difference of squares. Those are really the two main ones people have been struggling with. All right, so number five. In this one, we're solving a tree equation. Um, notice it says solve in green. That's some people are struggling with. And the reason why is it does say solve on the interval from um, zero less than or equal to theta less than two pi. That means you're trying to find theta, the angle. So I'm trying to solve for the angle. Now, the purple part where it says, hey, use the unit circle right here to graph the angle and then write the order of pairs, that's meant as us trying to give you a hint on how to find the answers. Um, and so when I go through this, I'm going to find the angle. Now, I might write down the coordinates or I might you know, mark the points but that's not the answer, that's the to help me. So that's the purple part is meant as a guide to assist, not as the answer. The answer is the green part, the find the angle. So in this case, I want to isolate the sine of x. You know what I'm gonna do first? I'm gonna change it to sine of theta. So I'm going to subtract the one, and then when I divide, I'm gonna get one half. So I have the sine of theta equals one half, and I want to find theta. I want to know what angle has a sine value of one half. And a better way of thinking of it is like this. Um, you want to find the angle in the unit circle that produces a point on that circle with a y value of one half. That's really what that purple part's trying to tell you, the hint it's giving you. So if I go to my unit circle, you know, here's where one half is, half the distance of the radius. And if I mark my points, I can see here there's one right there and there's one right there there's two of those and in this case it is closer to the x-axis it's a smaller slice so these look like they are sixths and so i have a pi sixth and if i look at the one on the left side i mean this angle is going to be a little bit less than one pi so then that's going to be five pi sixths and so those are my angles theta equals pi sixth and 5 pi 6. So I'm trying to find the angle. I did not write down the points, but I sorry, I didn't write down the coordinates. I did mark the points to help me though. And so pi 6, 5 pi 6 is the answer. Those are the two angles that we are looking for. All right, so number six. This does say find the asymptotes for these following rational functions. Check your answer with your calculator. Um, I want to make sure you understand is you will be expected to graph these. Just to save time, um, we're not going to graph them here. Um, but this is really where the main work is. Imagine if you can put it in your calculator and you can find these asymptotes down here, you should be able to uh, graph it. Um, so uh, if we're looking at the first one, remember before you even go forward with anything, you need to look at both the standard form and the factored form. And so I'm gonna factor the denominator into x plus six, x minus three. I need to look at both forms because standard form could help you with maybe finding asymptotes. Um, and then when it comes to factor form, it can help you with holes, points of discontinuity, POD, or vertical asymptotes. So notice right here, right here, I can see that I have x plus six over x plus six, and that's going to create a common factor in the top and the bottom, which is a hole. I'm gonna have a hole at the solution for x plus six, which is x equals negative six. So that's my point of discontinuity, POD and hole, same thing. So if those cross out, I'm left with one over x minus three. Now in that case, I'm gonna first look at my vertical asymptote, which is when the denominator equals zero. So in that part, I have x equals three, because if I have x minus three in the denominator, 
the solution to that is x equals 3. Remember, that's even the excluded value. So x equals 3 is my vertical asthope. My point of discontinuity is x equals negative 6. So now I'm left with, okay, what am I dealing with here? Horizontal or a slant? Um, and in this case, I have to look at the leading coefficients, which is really just 1 over x. And I can even see that here. If I have 1 over x minus 3, it's 1 over x. Now, in that case, I have a horizontal asymptote because you have to imagine what's going on as you plug in larger and larger and larger values for x. So 1 over infinity. If I take an object, one whole object, and cut it into an infinite amount of slices, those slices are going to be very, very, very tiny. They're going to be close to zero. And so y equals zero is your horizontal asymptote. Now, you could look at your calculator to help you with this end behavior thing, but you have to realize what is a horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote is the end behavior. It's telling me what is the graph approaching as it goes to positive and negative infinity. So in that case, it's going to match my horizontal asymptote. Um, now, the thing I would say if I was in class right now would be the most points lost on the team challenges, on the quizzes, all of that is not putting x equals for vertical, x equals for points of discontinuity, y equals for horizontal. The asymptotes are lines. You need to make sure you write down x equals for vertical asymptotes and points of discontinu discontinuity, and y equals for horizontal and slant asymptotes. For all that matters, remember, x equals and y equals. That's where probably the most points have been taken off with that. All right, so if I look at part B, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look at factored form first. There is a GCF in the bottom, and I'm going to change it to x plus 2. Now what do I deal with? Well, I'm going to look at my vertical asymptote. And in this case, the vertical asymptote, x plus 2 equals 0 is x equals negative 2. And you can see I have no point of discontinuity because there's no common factors in the top and the bottom. So now I have to look at my horizontal. So I'm going to look at the leading coefficients, which is 12x over 3x. Up, oh, that's my fault there. It's 12x over 3x, which gives me 4. So then I have a horizontal asymptote at, I can't just put 4, I have to put y equals, just like I have to have x equals for the vertical. Now, what does that mean for my end behavior? Well, that means my graph is going to approach 4 for both of those. So keep that in mind. And though you should be able to check these in your calculator. Um, again, if you're not going to use the fraction feature in your calculator, remember you have to put the numerator into parentheses and you need to put the denominator into parentheses um, when you type them in. But the main thing that people lost points on is not doing the x equals and not doing the y equals. Hence why I've repeated it a lot. All right, number seven, right? The piecewise function of proper notation. Hopefully you got some help with this um, with your team challenge. And this one as well, it's going to be on the individual. So let's take a look. And this is the one thing I was there in team challenge. So I will not take off for the team challenge for this. I would have announced it and made sure when I was going around that I addressed it. Um, so I'm going to address it now. So that way tomorrow you, you answer the question properly. It says improper notation. Proper notation means the way that you would be given it um, if it were a problem on a test, if it were a problem on a worksheet which is this general setup. The proper notation for a piecewise function is to have the f of x equals, and then you have this brace, and you have the two equations as represented with the restrictions. So this is what I mean by improper notation. Not just to write down two equations next to each other or something like that, is this is the format you need to use. So you can see I have the structure down here, and I'm just going to fill it in. And so if I take a look at this, this um, two of them, let's deal with the one on the left first. Let's deal with the absolute value graph. That has a vertex at negative 5, negative 3. And so that tells me when it comes to the absolute value equation, it's going to be the absolute value of x plus 5 and then minus 3 because that would have the vertex. So there is my equation. Now I need to figure out what is my boundary? What is my restriction? If x, what? Well, my restriction, it looks like, and I'll do a purple for it. It looks like it is negative 1. 
and the absolute value is to the left of it and the point on the absolute value is a closed circle. So if x is less than or equal to negative 1, there is the restriction. So now I have to deal with the open circle. Well, by the way, I can just do the restriction for that one first, right? I mean, it's an open circle. It's to the right of negative 1. So I could tell you this is going to be down here greater than negative 1. So there's that restriction. Now I just need my equation. Well, this is linear. That's good news. Um, it has a y-intercept of, it looks like, 4. So that's good news in that case. Um, so what's my slope? Well, if I take a look, I can see that it goes down 3, right 1. And so my slope is negative 3. So I have negative 3x plus 4 if x is greater than negative 1. And so the main point, like I said, I wanted to address here is what is proper notation that is writing it the way you would be giving it. And so I have the two equations, the absolute value. How do I know that was the format for absolute value? As you have to remember, transformations. You know, the general structure for a transformation form is x minus h plus k. It's the same for a quadratic, which is x minus h squared plus k. Um, that's why it's helpful to know those forms. Um, so that's number seven. All right, number eight, graphing at least two cycles, uh, so that means two periods of the following trig function. You know what? That's as easy as following a map, trademark Mr. Hansberg. So if I look at this, here are the things I'm looking for. Midline, amplitude, phase shift, period, map, trademark Mr. Hansberg. And so I'm going to color code it. Um, these are the parts, the purple, the blue, and the red that we're looking at. Um, your midline is the red part. It is Wait a minute, it's not 1, it's y equals 1. We need to remember the midline is the middle. It's y equals 1. My amplitude, that's your a value, it's the stretch factor, so that's 2. Phase shift, it is the h value, x minus h. So in this case, since I have x minus pi halves, it's going to be a positive pi halves. That's the left-right movement. So in this case, I'm going to the right, pi halves. Period, there is no B value. There's nothing being multiplied to that X, which means the normal period for a sine function is 2 pi. So this is what I'm going to look at when it comes to graphing. And so when I'm graphing, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to graph my midline. Y equals 1. Y equals, include the Y equals. Y equals 1. And then it's the amplitude. So I'm going to go up and down two units from that midline. So I'm going to have a value at my amplitude is going to hit a max of 3. It's going to hit a min of negative 1. Now phase shift. We have to remember sine graphs start in the middle because the sine of 0 is 0. So rather than starting on the midline at 0, I'm going to start in the midline at pi halves. And I'm going to go 2 pi units to the right. I'm not ending at 2 pi. I'm going to the right 2 pi. And so really what that means is if the starting point moved, I'm just going to say two boxes to the right, then the ending point will move two boxes to the right. And so notice two boxes to the right is where I have my dot of that two pi value. So that is one cycle. And remember what we do is we break it into the four quadrants. So I'm going to cut it in half and cut each of those in half. And each of those sections represents the quadrants, quadrant one, two, three, four around the unit circle. And remember, signs are the y values. So if I think about the unit circle, y values are positive for the first part. So when I look at this, it's going to rise first. Then it's going to hit the midline. Then it's going to fall. So I think it rises first. It's going to hit the high point. Then it's going to come down and hit the midline. Then it's going to go to the negative y values. And it's going to hit the minimum. Then it's going to come back up and hit the midline again. And so there is one sine cycle. Now I'm asked to graph at least two. So I need to follow this pattern. If I look at the pattern, it looks like every two boxes is a rise and a fall. So I'm going to follow it to the left and I'm going to follow it to the right. So if you haven't heard me stress it enough, midline is a y equals with it. It's not just the number. Um, make sure you understand how to graph a trig function by following a map. Hopefully one of you said trademark Mr. Hansberg. 
and we can do it this way. Um, and remember, your phase shift actually helps you with your period as well of where the new one's going to be. Because if the phase shift goes to the right two boxes, your period will go to the right two boxes from 2 pi as well. All right, so that is number eight. Let's finish up this video. And let's look at number nine. This is composition of functions. Now, there are two types here. There is one that is a composition of function with plugging one function into another where it says f of g of x. And the other is composition with numerical values, g of f of 2. So this one's the harder one. Now, what this means is you are taking the function g of x, which is 2x minus 5. That expression gets plugged into the input for f of x. So what that means is I'm really taking f of 2x minus 5. My input for the function f is 2x minus 5. So anywhere where I see the x, I'm going to put a parentheses and I'm going to plug in the 2x minus 5. So I have 3 times the quantity 2x minus 5 squared minus 2 times 2x minus 5 plus 5. Now here's how I deal with this. The easy part is actually the right side. It's this part. Um, because I can distribute the negative 2 and get negative 2x plus 10 and then plus 5 and just combine those and get negative uh, 4x plus 15. So I have the negative 2 to the 2x minus 5 plus 5, so I get negative 4x plus 10 plus 5, negative 4x plus 15. It's easy to deal with that right side. Uh, majority of people don't mess up the right side. This left side is the part that gets you know trickier, where more mistakes happen. And think algebra, order of operations. I have to deal with the exponent before I deal with the multiplication. So I have to square 2x minus 5 before I deal with multiplying by 3, before I deal with distributing the 3. So to square something means to multiply by itself. So 2x times 2x is 4x squared. 2x times negative 5 is negative 10x. And so I have 2x times negative 5 again, negative 10x, and I have a positive 25. Combine like terms there, I get 4x squared minus 20x plus 25. But that's not it, because that's just the squaring. I still have the 3 on the outside. So I'm going to have to put those in parentheses and multiply by that 3. So if I distribute that, I'm going to get 12x squared minus 60x plus 75 minus 4x plus 15. Now I just combine my like terms and I get my answer of negative 12, sorry, positive 12x squared minus 64x plus 90. And you're not going to be expected to factor if it's factorable. Um, I do not believe this one is. If it is, oh my goodness, it would be hard. You just distribute and combine like terms. You're trying to find the function it creates. So bottom line with this one is be sure to follow order of operations. If you have a coefficient, you need to do the exponents before you distribute. And to square something, you cannot think of it like, oh, I'm going to apply my power rule. You, you can't apply the power rule because it's a binomial. It is 2x minus 5 squared. The power rule only works if it was multiplication, 2x times 5 squared. Then you can do your power rule. But since it's subtraction, order of operations, exponents and subtraction cannot go together in order of operations. All right, the last one, g of f of 2. We'll save this one. It's a little bit easier. Let's first find f of 2. Well, f was 3x squared minus 2x plus 5. So really, I'm going to have 3 times my input squared plus 2 uh, minus 2 times my input plus 5, where my input is 2. Well, this is just order of operations. I'm going to get 12 minus 4 plus 5, which is 13. So that's just the f of 2. So that means I'm going to take 13 and I'm going to make it the input for my g function. And the g function is twice your input minus 5. So 2 times 13 minus 5, 26 minus 5, 21. Nothing too much there. Um, it didn't happen in this example. Just remember if you square a negative, even if you type in your calculator wrong, remember you know a negative squared is positive. Um, the big one, like I said, is 9a with understanding what it means a square binomial and the order of operations part if the year, if there is a coefficient in front of the squaring. All right, but this is the review. Uh, like I said, since I'm not there, I want to make sure I address some of the things that I um, would have addressed if I was in class for the grading. Uh, besides that, good luck. Uh, study hard. There are resources online for all the solutions. Check the closure slide for those. I'll even post the answers to these online as well, so you can look at it there too. But take care, good luck, and study hard.